maybe it waits until oh there you go no nope, looks like we're good all right oh oh hey maybe it waits until oh there you go no nope, it looks like we're good all right oh, oh. <laughs> hey. righty issues one second so professional the most professional yeah we're doing good like we're doing good, good. Already issues. One second. So professional. The most professional. Yeah, we're doing. This is why you pay Brad all those all that money. You see, this is what happens. This is what happens <laughs> when we fire Brad, and now we're going to have to pay him more and beg him to come back because yep. we can't handle the technology on our own. Clearly. All right. Now we're making. Now we're making work back extra work for him. <laughs> so let's let, let let so let's let's start this. Hey guys, welcome to Cast Strength. I'm Vito. That's Josh, and we have a very special guest. While Brad is temporarily fired, hopefully for not too long, <laughs> because of all Please the issues. Back. <laughs> Mr. Adam, better at tasty notes than Whittington Brunder. <laughs> Re remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that little bell button so you know when we go live. Today we have a uh, the phenomenal phenomenology. From Compass Box, a brief discussion of U.S. and Canadian liquor laws, and as always, we'll end the show with some fiddly bits. Um, but we'll start today with some affordable picks from our personal vaults. Hey, hey, yeah. What's your uh, so, Adam? You you chose Deanston as your yeah. affordable pick. It's wonderful Deanston Virgin Oak that I appear to be out of at the moment, but I always pour a little bit of a backup. But through the magic of science, yeah, through the magic of television. <laughs> uh, yeah um this whiskey uh sort of we sort of ran into each other i uh through some convoluted series of events uh won a 25 dollars gift card to my uh local grocery store and my friend also won a 25 dollars gift card uh my roommate and uh we had gotten into the habit of splitting uh small bottles of whiskey with each other so this was the one that we both noticed was only 50 dollars uh, which is by far the cheapest single malt uh, around. Uh, and I said, well, you know, if, if we're going to spend money at the grocery store anyways, and you have $25 and I have $25, we could both just split this bottle of whiskey. Uh -huh. So there it was. And then we tried it. And at first, eh, it was all right. I mean, it's a, so what it is, if you're not familiar, Deanston is a Highland distillery. Uh, this one is uh, 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 finished in virgin oak casks. So a scotch, as you know, has to be aged in used oak, uh, but it can be finished in new oak. Uh, right. Uh, uh, so this is bottled at 46.3%. It says natural color and unchill filtered on the bottle, which you're never going to get uh, on any other bottle in that price range. Uh, and this one I found really got better as it oxidized and sat. The, definitely the last half of the bottle was better than the first half of the bottle. By the way, we didn't end up splitting it. I ended up just drinking the entire bottle myself because uh, I enjoyed it so much. So if I understand the story correctly, that means you and your friend were supposed to split a virgin, but you ended up taking it all for yourself. <laughs> God. Yes, that <laughs> and, is. That's, and there we go. That's <laughs> the right. That's the right way to, to parse that story. Very good. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah uh, heavy on the the new oak notes as you'd expect deanston is sort of a light and fresh uh right. highland single malt uh lots of fresh citrus fresh apples uh caramel toffee and this one i've like i prefer this uh this version of deanston to the 12 year old i think it has more going on oh really uh, which is sort of awesome like you know there aren't that many no age statement whiskeys that hold up to uh their age stated uh, uh, sister releases. Sure. So I think that's pretty cool. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about getting the 12 myself because I just finished a bottle of the 14 uh, that was left over, the 14 organic. Oh. And uh, I was going to get the 12 because uh, Roy Acavite recommended it, which I'm, I'm sure it's great. But I, I had the Virgin Oak once before, uh, but it's been quite a while. Yeah. I mean, uh, this bottle's been empty for uh, a couple months now, but. Yeah, I, you know, in the regular one's great as well. It might have been the context that I had it in where it seemed a little bit more lackluster than maybe it otherwise would be. Right. But this one, 
it, you take a sip of it and you get, it's a punch of fresh apple and then it gets all sweet and rounded and caramel. And then the oak comes in sort of a dry, almost like a sandalwood sort of thing. It's delicious. Nice. This is the first glass of it in some time and I'm already enjoying it. Oh, awesome. Mm. Uh, so what have you got there, Josh? I have a bourbon that was recommended to me by the Weddle. The Weddle. The Weddle said, if you ever see this on a shelf, you had better buy it. So when I have... It comes in a plastic bottle, so you know it's an affordable Ooh, pick. Screw top. Fair. I have the Ancient Ancient Age, which, do you know what makes Ancient Ancient Age special? Uh, squared, Ancient Squared is my, is my guess. It's twice the ancient, but still the same age. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know how that works, man. But I, this is the uh, is Buffalo Trace, obviously. Uh, it's the same mash bill as uh, Blanton's and, and a few other products, right? Uh, my understanding is this is essentially what didn't quite make the cut to be Blanton's. It's not a single barrel product or anything like that. A um, little bit lower proof. It's, it's uh, 90 proof. They used to make a version of it that was called uh, Ancient Ancient Age 10 Year, but if you can see right there, this is the 10 star version. Ah. They, they don't make the 10 year anymore, so if you see that ah. on the shelf, you should grab that, the age statement version. Uh, I, but, I, hate, I hate that lazy labeling. They didn't even bother taking the number out. They just took the 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 word. It's literally all they changed. Yeah, it's, they, they had yeah, such a good opportunity to do something different, right. and they were just like, nah, like... Yeah. No, no. We're I'm surprised just... that's actually allowed, to be honest. Yeah, I think there's a whole approval ten, process or something like that, but uh, the 10 year does not exist anymore. And in fact, I, from what I understand, this is pretty hard to find. I just happened upon some in Austin, uh, a good stash of it. So pick some up. And I, I actually compared it against genuine Blanton's, uh, and it's pretty damn close. You know, it's not, not at all far off. So. Definitely, cool. uh, definitely good stuff, and you know, for that much bourbon for twenty seven dollars, I think it was uh, rock and roll. Yeah, perfect. So, um, Vito got something similar, although vastly more common. Uh, yeah, you can find this everywhere, and it's a great budget pick. Yeah, so I got uh, the Wild Turkey one hundred and one, which was my first uh, bourbon. And I used it to get uh, acclimated to bourbon. Uh, being, being, um, being more of a Scotch guy, I'm, uh, I'm more acclimated to that fl the flavor pro profile. So I used this in uh, Old Fashioned to um, essentially slowly build up my, my profile for um, the... Um, for the bourbon character, right? It's a it's a spicy one too. It's fairly fairly high rye. Yeah. yeah. So, but it, it stands up beautifully in cocktails because of that high proof, right? So that yeah, it doesn't uh, disappear. Yeah. So it's 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 a one hundred and one, and for anyone listening that's not uh, that's not fully aware or uh, accustomed to hearing proof versus ABV, um, the proof is just double what the ABV is. So one hundred and one. Proof would be uh, fifty point five percent ABV. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's uh, I it did it did its job. I got used to it, and I kind of opened my eyes to to bourbon. And um, I got a couple on the shelf now. Uh, some High West Eagle Rare, Angels Envy, the Wild Turkey. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just a lot of toffee and. Um, I'm, apparently I'm getting, uh, there's some echoes. Is the echo fixed? Yeah, the echo's been gone for a bit. Okay, good. Um, and, um, yeah, no, it's great. It's vanilla, toffee, caramel. The spiciness of it always sticks out to me the most as the, yeah. like, the defining characteristic. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, it's great. And, um, even in Canada, I'm pretty sure it's only about $35. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think right. between 35 and 40 and 40 dollars, so just around 30 bucks American. Sure. Yeah, it tends to be about 25 or something around here. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so in Canada, it's a great it's a great budget pickup, um, uh, especially if you if you want to get into bourbons. So it's a little bit of rec- uh, I, I recommend this to anybody um, that asks. So yeah, yeah you- and it's uh, it's it's just a great pick pick up. Uh, you know, e- easy to drink bourbon. Now, well, for me now, if you're a, if you're a bourbon drinker, it's you know what it is, right? But for right. someone that's not always um, that's not act, um, used to drinking bourbon. It, you can warm up to it really easily. Yeah, it does have uh, that that higher proof kick to it, uh, which is nice, especially like you said in a cocktail. But um, um, it, it's a good contrast against something like this. Ancient H and H is uh, a little bit of a softer, rounder, uh, more sweet caramel profile. It doesn't have as as high of a rye content, I believe, um, versus the wild turkey. But uh, yeah, that's good stuff. It's good yeah. stuff. Yeah, as you know, as I think about it, I've never tried it in a cocktail, but this Ginsu I'd imagine would also stand up pretty well because it's got a good proof and it's it's spicy, and you know it's cheaper than Monkey Shoulder here, which is sort of incredible. Right. But if you're looking, if you like Monkey Shoulder in your cocktails, but you want sort of a less fruity profile, maybe more spicy uh, Highland profile, uh, that might work really well. Yeah, I mean, of of course, uh, Adam legendary for his tasting notes. So, I mean, if you're going to take recommendations from anyone, that would be the guy. I, I, I bought a whiskey recently on Adam's recommendation uh, just, just yesterday, actually. The Aaron Malt 14-year-old. Which, oh, yes. My good friend. Oh. Oh, it's fantastic. I tried a little bit of it last night. And I remember one of the first times I was ever uh, talking to Adam, he uh, described it as having fudginess. <laughs> in the in the flavor profile and i really got a kick out of the the uh, the tasting note fudginess and then i'm sitting there last night and i'm sipping on a little bit of this aaron malt right and i'm getting all these you know kind of floral notes and maybe some citrusy things and stuff like that and i get about halfway through and i take a sip and my in my head i'm just like oh that kind of tastes like fudge oh my god fudginess. <laughs> there it is yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. Highly recommend it. I'm on the Aaron train now. You've sold me. Yeah, welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's 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 weird that how that works because you live uh, a five hour plane ride away from from us, and you took his recommendation. I live a twenty minute drive from Adam. I still haven't had an Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, what you're doing? doing? Why not? <laughs> And I was, I was, I, sh- I should have, I should have, I should have asked him today. He's like, yeah, I need to have some air before I leave your place. Right. Yes, you. Yeah. yeah. I just, uh, I'm out of that 14 now. I have right now the 10 year old, which is also good. Probably not as good as the 14 in my opinion. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and the Amarone cask finish. And Amarone is a, is apparently a dry Tuscan red wine. Uh-huh. And the, the, uh, it, the profile of that pairs so well with the profile of the Aaron spirit. It's like the best parts of a dry Italian red wine, which I really like. The best part of Isle of Aaron, which I really like, smooshed together and right. it manages to be successful and delicious. Yeah, they have a huge range of those cask finishes, right? The Amarone's one, they've got a port one, and uh, like two or three more, right? Yeah, I think so. I've heard that they don't do the Madeira anymore, but I've heard that the Madeira was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the port cask is also delicious. I've tried that one as well. Yeah, I was kind of torn. I was going to pick up the port cask, and then I decided to just go with the core fourteen. and And the price on it was kind of unbelievable too. It was like fifty five bucks for a fourteen year old whiskey. That's that's pretty solid, you know. You yeah, I mean, even that. here, even here, and we're going to talk about the differences between uh, each of our liquor systems later. But like, I want to say it's ninety bucks around where we are, Canadian, of course. Right. And Oban, Oban 14 is like 115. So wow. Yeah, no, you don't find a uh, you don't find a 14 year old single malt uh, at that price, really, with anything else. Sure, sure, exactly. Before before we move on, mm. um, as per usual, I need to shout out a certain a certain bottle, yeah. um, because one of our one of our uh, uh, guests tonight. Mitchell Gillette said, I keep holding off on monkey shoulder. Just feels like I can get something better for not a lot more. You in the monkey shoulder. I swear to God. <laughs> I went and got it. <laughs> I had to get it. Um, there's, 
I'm always going to find an excuse to bring it on. Uh, I had an idea, but this is a lot better. Uh, Today's Mitchell. episode of Cast Strength brought to you by Monkey Shoulder. <laughs> Mitchell, definitely. If if you find it on sale, um, it's it's worth it. Um, I'm not too sure where where exactly you are, but um, I uh, it'll it'll hold a place on my shelf. Um, right. but, oh, he's in uh, Toronto, dude. Is he? Oh, yeah. this Mitchell. Yeah, we, oh, my we met him. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll just wait until it gets goes on clearance. Hopefully, at one of the one of your nearest LCBOs. Don't hold your breath, though. Yeah. <laughs> God, Dallas. Something for a similar profile? Uh, Deanston. And also Glenn Geary Founders Reserve, which I think is 60 bucks, which is still cheaper than Monkey Shoulder. Also very good. But yeah. Um, so, Vito. Yes, sir. We were talking earlier this week about donuts. It was National Donut Day a couple it days was. ago. It was. It was. We were reminded of the of the food holidays that happen literally every day, <laughs> literally every day they're made up. But anyway, it was national. Wasn't it national buy a donut day? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, very I think, yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Which it clearly is a totally different deal than national donut day. You right. gotta have both. But, uh, we started, we started discussing how, what's the proper spelling of donuts. And I don't, I don't know if Adam weighed in on this issue. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, as long as you're spelling crispy and cream with K's, then I'll, I'll take <laughs> that's, that's, you're that's, all good. Yeah. That's the that's the right answer. I feel, like, <laughs> I feel like that's a perfect way of just moving on from this. <laughs> you know. No, but but seriously, uh, like I've always spelled donuts D O N U T S. Right, and my response to that was that donuts are made out of dough; they're not made out of dew. They're not made out of nuts, though, so maybe maybe nut is the misspelled part. Maybe. Well, well we were talking hmm. about that. Apparently, the nut back in the day used to be what we would now call donut holes, or maybe you Canadians would call timbits. Yeah, mm -hmm. timbits. Timbits. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those were the the nuts, and then it just translated over over time to to meaning what we call donuts today. Yeah, I think we must have had like, like a good twenty minute like. It was forever forth. talking about donuts. It was the the great donut. Debate. Not even the donut. How to spell the donut? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it got it got ugly at at, at points. I think there's some yeah, strong feelings about this. It was all caps, and it, it was all. <laughs> I'm scarred, guys. Yelling. Um. When you come here, Vito, uh, well, and Adam, Adam, when you make it down here as well, there's mm -hmm. the world famous Round Rock Donuts, not too far from the house here, and they make the Texas size donut, which is yay big. Just you, had me, your head. you had me at rock. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah I, I got to play to the stereotypes. Yes. So it's good. Yeah. So so for those who don't know, Adam is a rock science man. Yeah, I, I got plenty of rocks right here that I won't bring out on stream because it isn't a rock stream. I'll probably do a rock stream one day, but it won't be on this uh, podcast. So. That's another show. Yes, <laughs> that's another show. <laughs> so we, yeah. we, we touched upon it really briefly. Um, and uh, I think we should, should t t get into it a little bit more. Um, the laws in... You know, general U.S. laws and Canadian laws, but more maybe more specifically, something that we're the three of us are way more comfortable talking about um, yeah. our individual province laws and uh, state laws. Um, I know in in Texas, Josh, it's uh, you have you still get, you guys have a three tier system, um, right? Uh, for your for your liquor, right? Um, right. Distribution, right? Right, yeah. So uh, you can either be a producer, like a distillery, a distributor, or a retailer. And if you play in one of those tiers, then you cannot participate in any of the other two, right? So if you're a distiller, then you can't distribute. If you're a distributor, then you can't distill, etc. Um, that's so. That's so weird. Right, which leads to uh, distilleries technically can't sell. Uh, their their product directly to consumers. So what happens is they, you know, of course they sell bottles at the distillery, but it's um, it's kind of a separate entity. And there's some weird legal stuff that goes on where they they sell the bottles to a distributor and then they buy them back and sell them for retail sale. 
Um, so there's ways that, you know, to get around this law and not make it super inconvenient, but, uh, it's, it's, it's just kind of silly. Um, you know, it makes it, makes it tough. Uh, I know the distillers around here generally would want to sell their product directly to consumers when they can. And I mean, breweries were the same way around here for quite a while. They used to play this game where if you went, I got my office is right next to a, a brewery called Austin Beer Works. And Austin Beer Works had a happy hour for years and years. You'd go over there and you'd give them uh, money and they would give you tokens. And you'd take those tokens over to the bar and the tokens were good for exchanging for a glass, which they would then fill with beer for free. Oh, uh, that work around. <laughs> and that was really common. People would do it, do, different places would do it with tokens or tickets or, you know, you'd buy the glass and the glass is what you purchased, but the beer was free. You know, that's, that's the way they got around it. <laughs> Um, but that, that recently, uh, just in the last few years got changed and you, you can just go to a, the brewery and buy beer like any bar, uh, and it's fine. Uh, so hopefully they streamline and, and, and change some of the laws around the way distilling works here. Um, now I've, I've, I have a question. Do, how does it work? Um, state to state like can you how many is there a limit to how many bottles someone from texas can bring back from let's say um kentucky no uh, you, you may have some like trouble if you try and fly with a bunch of bottles or something like but i could i mean, in fact i've done this with beer and with whiskey you know if i'm going on a drive uh to somewhere i can buy as much as i like and and leave for example we went to santa fe spirits in santa fe new mexico uh, where uh, they make the Cole Keegan single malt and coming from Texas, I'm thinking, Oh, there's probably some kind of local state law about how many bottles I can buy at the distillery. And, and uh, we took the tour and get a tasting and stuff. And I started asking the guy that was, that was uh, taking care of us. I said, uh, so I want to bring some of these back for myself. I brought some back to, to uh, the whiskey vault and they did an episode on them. And uh, turns out he said, no, if you buy it by the case, I'll give you a discount. No, so, you know, no problem there, but in Texas, it's limited to two per person every 30 days. Weird. Which, yeah, is, is, is tough. And people find ways to get around it, of course. I mean, they legislate all these things and people just figure out, well, you know, you bring your wife and she has a driver's license so she can get two bottles too, you know, and people do these sure. things where they bring uh, extra people to get extra bottles. So at the end of the day, people find ways around it. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you guys uh, in Ontario specifically have state controlled stores, which is a thing in the U S too, not in Texas, but mm -hmm. you know, some States have that. Yeah. Pennsylvania yes. has, has it. Um, and uh, I have a quick story about Pen Pennsylvania. I was just there and they just upgraded their POS system uh. at their liquor stores. And I talked, I, I mentioned this to you, Josh. Um, I mean, I think I was talked about it with you too, Adam. Um, mm -hmm. their, new, their new POS doesn't allow you to pay with a bank, uh, with, a, with a credit card or debit card connected to a bank. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> so, <What>? so <laughs> yeah. So what? You, have to pay, you have to pay cash or you got to go buy like a prepaid MasterCard or Visa. That's unbelievable. Wow. I went, yeah, I went to two, di uh, uh, three different. Um, I forget what the what their wine is. I think it's to not total wine, uh, wine and spirits or something like that. Uh -huh. And uh, the first one I went to, I I tried to pay with my visa and it didn't work. And he's like, "Oh, we've been having trouble with the new POS because it's not accepting uh, bank cards." <laughs> I was like, "But how 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 do you how, how do you sell?" Right. It's like, it's like like prepaid cards or cash. That's so I was like, silly. that is so inconvenient. And then I went to another one, one of the newer ones, thinking that, you know, maybe it's this, you know, and yeah, s same thing. So yeah, it just, it's one of those, I don't know, it's just weird. Like the state, the state decided to upgrade systems and it was, it just like, I don't know if, I don't know if it's still that or if they, it was like a slow rollout, but that's, it really got caught me off guard. Yeah, that's a pain. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, going back to uh, like Ontario laws, um, Canada and Canada as a whole is uh, is is sort of still in that prohibition sort of deal that America's still in. 
Right. Um, there's weird right. There's, like, there's no. There's still no. Not. Not as much freedom as there should be in 2018. Right. Yeah. Ontario, uh, especially, actually. Yeah, Ontario, special. So, like, if I'm traveling, when I came back from from Austin, um, I wasn't in the states long enough. I you have to be right. you have to be there for over 48 hours uh, to bring back a uh, a bottle of spirit over 40 percent. Right. Um, and anything over that, I have to pay, uh, taxes on and the taxes for anything over 40% alcohol is, is typically double the retail of what you paid for the bottle. That's just insane. As an example of this, I've gone to a, one of these, uh, a a handy website called (laughs) CanadianDutyCalculator.com. There's Uh, whole websites dedicating to helping you figure out this mess. Well, it's a, it's a big deal to try and work around. I know, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be going to Detroit in a couple of, uh, in in a week or so. And uh, I'm already, my head's spinning about my, you know, my family who lives in Detroit, having them, you know, run laps. I'll work it out. Anyways. Uh, but if I wanted to say buy a bottle of uh, Balconis, so Balconis mm-hmm. single malt, I can't get it in Ontario. They don't import it here. Right. Um, it's about eighty bucks Canadian uh, with the exchange rate. According to the duty calculator, on that eighty dollar bottle, I would have to pay an additional sixty six and a half dollars in tax. Oh my god! Yeah. Wow. When I when I came back with uh, Angel's Envy, I brought back two bottles. Uh, I had to pay the bottle cost me forty nine dollars. I had to pay fifty dollars um, for the bottle. Oh my god! To bring it back into into Canada, otherwise I'd have to leave it at the at the border control. Jeez! But yeah. that's on that's Ontario. Um, there are other other provinces operate a little bit differently. Um, I'm fairly certain Alberta allows you to bring back more than a more than uh, more than a bottle if you're. If you're there for uh, over 24 hours, if I'm yeah, not you, mistaken, you have a certain amount that you can bring back, dude. Yeah, to, right. Like it's a, it's a bottle and a half or something. But like then that. then their their duties are uh, different than um, the Ontario duties because they're the 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 province like the province of Alberta doesn't operate under the else like the Ontario Liquor Control Board, right? So their their system taxes differently than our system mm. sure sure it's it's all mm. kinds of uh it's all kinds of craziness and yeah. uh there's a special site that we know um that if you go to it ardbeg ugudal is 98 dollars. adam yeah yeah 98 dollars yeah. in alberta uh-huh. in in ontario it's 187 right now oh my god can yeah. you, those are can you, so that's canadian numbers right so right. 75, 75 versus about $140. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So and that's now there, insane. Yeah, there are even inter- interprovincial t- uh, tariffs. Now, a couple things. First of all, you're, you're never, ever going to get pulled over going between provinces. Like, sure. there's, no way, there's no way they could possibly enforce this. Right. Uh, but up to just this summer... Uh, the limit, uh, you know, bringing between provinces at once was, I think, three liters of spirits per, per person per trip. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and over the summer, that uh, that actually uh, that actually increased. All the uh, premiers, who were the heads of, were basically governors of the provinces and territories, got together and mm-hmm. agreed to basically double that to six liters of spirits. That um, that takes effect. That takes effect in two years. Wow. Yes, apparently. Yeah, 2020 is when is when you uh, that 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 limit doubles. Well, that's just it, isn't it? Like a lot of these things are just so difficult to enforce and you have to inv- invest so much time and money and and resources into into trying to invest uh, into busting people like that. I mean, it's like sh- trying to ship um alcohol in and out of the country especially and and even within the country can be a pain. I, I you guys can do shipping within the country relatively yes. easily, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can. yeah. It's not, I mean, of course, everybody labels it olive oil or, you know, vinegars or something like that, right? Yeah. There's sort of a don't ask, don't tell policy with the Canada Post, which is right. basically like the USPS. Right. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I think it's customary to include a box of Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese so that the shaking and rattling sound of the box will disguise a. Uh, 
uh, any liquids that might be uh, inside as well? The sloshing, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, it, actually, the the recommendation here is to not use the U.S. Postal Service ever at all because that can be a felony. But, oh, damn. But um, if you ship it UPS or FedEx, you know, it's generally not – an issue. And, and I, yeah, I take anytime I've, I used to ship beer up to a buddy in Michigan and he'd ship stuff back down to me. And, uh, we, we would always just kind of pre-print the label off the website and go and drop it off. No questions asked. And I, I never had a problem. Uh, nice. so, yeah, there's all these laws and regulations and things to be scared of, but in the end, it's always difficult to enforce. Like you were saying. Yeah. Um, now, of course, international borders are completely different. Like, Oh yeah. Uh, uh, you heard one, about Vito, you'll get caught. One day we'll, one day we'll have an international guest on and he'll tell us all about uh, the UK shipping laws. Yeah, yeah. I tried to ship some stuff to the UK to a friend and and we uh, we arranged everything in advance and whatever and they uh, they made me open the package at uh, DHL at the airport. Wow. And and yeah, I got my hand slapped for trying to trying to ship a bottle of whiskey as a gift. Single bottle of whiskey as a gift to a to a guy that just can't get what he was looking for over in the UK. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Speaking um, of gifts, that, we have the same thing. If if like uh, if I come down to Austin or if I come down to the states or Vegas or wherever, and someone gifts gifts me a bottle, right? right? Let's say I'm traveling from Toronto to Austin, and in the duty free in Toronto, I buy a bottle, right? That I see for a good price, whatever I buy it. And then I come down to the States, I get a bottle gifted to me, right? Right. When I come, if I come back into, into Canada with both those bottles, I pay duty on both those bottles. Right. Yeah. It's like giving somebody a puppy or something, right? Like Because, because I <laughs> yeah. bought a bottle that was meant for export only mm-hmm. and I'm bringing it back into Canada because I, I bought it in, in Canada. And like, even if I tell you like one's a gift or like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's still, you're bringing a bottle into Canada. You still got to pay taxes on it. It's right. Crazy. And we, we all know, uh, we all know, you know, at least a handful of uh, whiskey tribe guys that are over in the UK, Ireland, places like that. And, and, uh, they're able to order stuff off Amazon and ship stuff That's and insane. order things. And you're just like, man, I saw Ian, Ian in the chat is over in the UK, I think lives in London, I believe. And uh, yeah. yeah, he's and hearing all of this uh, weird legal shit makes me so glad he lives in the UK. Yeah. He's ma- Master of Malt would make so much money off me just ordering those one ounce samples of whiskey. Right? Yeah. Right. Like for, for $3, I get to try something new. Like, like come on, that's practically nothing. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. That would be, that would be ludicrous. Um, speaking of something new yeah we, we all three of us have a uh, pour that uh, well, yeah. at least I, haven't, I haven't had before this has been I requested too because it's it's tough being in mul- uh, multiple different locations uh, to, to drink the same whiskey right so yeah. we don't necessarily have access to it or have it in our collections but it just so happens mm-hmm. we were all able to get our hands on Compass box phenomenology. Phenomenon. Um, yeah, uh, it's. I have had it before, but this is both y'all's first time, right? My first it's, time. I haven't had it before. Right. Yeah. Vito's, Vito's glass actually comes from the bottle that I have. We uh, split it with a whole bunch of people, and uh, I'm taking mine from my uh, uh, from my tiny bottle just so I keep track of. Uh, uh, you know, make sure that I'm drinking my portion of the bottle that you split. Sure, sure. But yeah, not all of it's claimed though. So if I really like it, I might just, you know, end up taking some more of it and saying, oh yeah, I'll, I'll just pay for that. That'll be fine. So. Hey, Patrick just showed up. Hey, Patrick. Hey. Uh, Ian said uh, those, those three pound samples add up quickly. I'm sure, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Sure. It's gotta yeah. be an addictive thing. Um, so the, the phenomenology is uh, a little weird. They're, the whole concept is to not really tell you a whole lot about the whiskey, which is unlike Compass Box. They're usually extremely transparent. But their goal here was to not lead you on the tasting notes too much, right? Yeah. Yeah, they do which tell is, you what's is, in it. really nice. Yeah, they do tell you what's in the whiskey. They just yeah. don't give you any tasting notes. Right, right, right. Yeah, still they, they have their typical breakdown of where they sourced it from, yeah. Mm-hmm. And how they finished it and all that. So, and if, 
if anybody's interested, I could uh, I could rattle that off while we're all getting settled with the glass here. I get to take the yeah, go take for the it. Yeah. off of mine Absolutely. just because I happen to have the recipe details in front of me. Uh, so it is. Oh crap! I'm gonna have to move my phone because it's in the way of the. Oh, all right, we're good. Um, so uh, this whiskey is seventy two percent. Richard Refill Hogsheads from Glen Lossy Distillery, which, has, which I believe is in Speyside. Uh, it's 24.5% first fill ex bourbon casks from Tamdu, uh, which is another Speyside distillery. They have a cask strength whiskey, which is really excellent. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, 2% uh, Richard Hogsheads from Highland Park. Uh, uh, yeah, and that is peated whiskey from Highland Park. Interesting. Mm hmm. Uh, it's 1% refill butts, uh, heh, refill butts, uh, <laughs> from, uh, from Talisker. So Ew. everyone knows Talisker. And then it's half a percent of uh, hogsheads from, I believe it's Kalila. Yes, Kalila. So also heavily peated Isla whiskey. So there's, yeah, uh, it's uh, 3.5% uh, peated whiskey. You, you gotta love those things. Yes, yeah, three and a half percent. That, and I, I believe it absolutely must make a difference in the final product. But oh, it seems like so such a small good. number, right? Yeah, but it's still yeah. you still taste you still smell it. You're right, like, right. Get that brine, brine and peat right away, even though it's such a small percentage. Like that just speaks. I mean, you know, I'm kind of just making fun of it, but uh, the, a master blender going. You know what this needs? Three percent peat. <laughs> <laughs> That'll yeah, really. You know, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, 90% of the people uh, who are watching right now have tried, uh, you know, putting a drop of Ardbeg into their Jameson or something. Yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. And, and they all know that makes a difference. Yeah. No, no question about it. So I want to give my notes on this, but I'd rather just listen to Adam. The most okay. epic <laughs> tasting notes of anyone ever. Yeah. Oh, just a second. Hmm. So, uh, this is a small, small release, right? Like uh, 7,908 bottles. There you go. Very small release. Pretty small, yeah. Okay, quick, so... Jeffrey, Jeffrey Patron asked if he should pop his Dark Storm. The answer is always yes. Yeah, come on. Like, Dark Storm is always yes. <laughs> this podcast does need 3.7% more, Pete. That's correct. That's true. So, in the... In the 30 seconds that I've been nosing this, it's completely changed. Right? So it first, absolutely does change. It, yeah. <laughs> that's bizarre. At first, for me, it was all fresh fruit, like fresh apples, fresh orange. Uh, and now it's all like dark, like slightly burnt pastries, uh, a little bit of cinnamon, custardy, like custardy vanilla. It's probably coming from that like uh, uh, first fill ex bourbon component. So here's what happens when I listen to Adam, right? He starts rattling off all of these amazing sounding notes. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I totally get that. Holy yeah. God. I'm so suggestible to your tasting notes. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Everyone's suggestible to anyone's tasting notes. I remember when I was, when I was watching uh, Aquavides last stream, uh, I was breaking open some of that. Uh, what was it? Hazelburn 13 year old uh, Oloroso matured, which uh, the magnificent Jeffrey Patron brought up for me. Nice. And he mentioned, uh, I was telling him that, you know, I was really enjoying it. And he said that he always picks up olives in that, uh, in that hazel burn. And oh. yeah, as soon as he said it instantly, like green olive brine, right, which, right. Is, which is really cool. It's funny how that works. Uh, and sometimes you can ruin something for somebody by telling them what you get in it. Like, uh, I, yeah. I remember there was a mead a few years ago that a friend of mine was drinking and he's like, wow, this is amazing. I really love this. It's great. I'm like, oh, okay. So what, you don't like it? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't want to tell you what I'm, what I'm tasting in it because you seem to enjoy it so much. It's like, no, no, no. Tell me. I said, well, it tastes like toothpaste. And he's going, <laughs> he goes, God damn it. Oh I no. no, I can't drink this anymore. Oh no. Josh, <laughs> the ruiner of things. Yeah, I ruin everything. Wow, it's sort of snapped back to citrus for me. Like almost like a like a nectarine or something. That's not citrus, but uh there's some interesting floral notes in there too, uh to me. I absolutely I can't really pinpoint exactly what that is, but 
Yeah, it's 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 quite complex for being like also fairly light at the same time. Wait till you yeah. taste it. Yeah. Like uh, it, it's not what I expected on the taste. Oh, there's the peat. Weird. Yeah. Yeah, the peat shows up as like a little peppery spike. In mm -hmm. there. there was some tannin coming in. The Brent 420 asked, is it just me or is it Vito looking less binging with Babish these days? You're looking a lot smoother these days. That's true. That's true. Uh, I'm, I'm, hold on. I'm, um, I'm looking real smooth because I've been drinking a lot of smooth monk shoulder. Oh, God. <laughs> this episode of Cast Strength brought to you by Monkey Shoulder. <laughs> Um, no, uh, nobody told me that I was going to be hosting the uh, podcast tonight with Moby. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I, I'll tell the story real quick. I dressed up as um, I was growing my hair. If anyone didn't notice the last two episodes, my hair was getting a little bit long up top. Um, I went as George Costanza for Halloween. <laughs> so I, I shaved out the top of my head and I was rocking the 1980s, 90s, you know, side. We've crown. seen some amazing pictures of this, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then once uh, Saturday night was over, uh, Sunday, um, actually, no, it was actually Monday morning because they didn't bring enough, uh, enough uh, shaving uh, like supplies to shave my whole head. So I had to live with it for an entire day when no one could take me seriously whatsoever. <laughs> Did you go into public places with that ridiculous get up and just like have people staring well, at you? You know what? Surprise. Well, Saturday night, because like I was out, you know, and it was Halloween. So people were really, were receptive to it and people were, sure. were on the ball. And then Saturday, uh, sorry, Sunday, mm -hmm. I went out uh, with a hat, but then instinctively when I sat down, I took it off. <laughs> and then I, I saw some looks and I was like, Oh, and I put the hat back on. <laughs> Um, but yeah, then when I shaved, when I shaved, um, I had to shave my beard as well Saturday night because George Costanza doesn't have a beard. For sure. Uh, so now I just gotta work my way back up through the levels of uh, Babish to make to get my sit in my rifle spot. That guy, he has the most beautiful voice on YouTube. I swear. Yeah, he He's really, does. he really does. I would really love, nice. I would love uh, if, like, for my anime fans, uh, a fusion between him. And Aqua Vitae. He should do voiceover work, really, like for for animation. Uh, you know, it's funny you should mention that about uh, being uh, Halloween, so people were receptive to it. I was, uh, I stopped by. Uh, to, it was when I bought the Aaron malt at mm -hmm. uh, Specs here. I was walking around the the Scotch Isle and the Bourbon Isle in there in my uh, local store, and I saw this lady walking around with like blood smeared on her face and a necklace made of rats. <laughs> and I was yeah. just like, oh yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, on any other day, <laughs> completely terrifying. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the um, back to the, how about them whiskeys? How I'm about them? Yeah. Enough about my smoothness. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. It's gone back from like for me. It's gone back from like it, it was a more of a honey sweetness, and now it's back to like a toffee sort of cooked sugar sweetness. Yeah, 100%. right. Yeah. It went. It went right back to that. Yeah, and like sort of sort of like a toasted marshmallow. Like there's like just that yeah. tiny amount of peat. Yeah, like, absolutely. It's toasted marshmallows. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> it's so delicious. You ever want to just taste the most amazing things in your whiskey? Just hang out with Adam and have him talk. That's that's what you're gonna get. I mean, we'll I'll talk about this a little more later if we have time. But it's all practice. It, literally, it's all practice. But yeah, this is delicious. Right. Like really, really tasty. And again, like it's a light whiskey. It's not like you know, it's not like a sherry monster. It's not like it's not even like peated like a Highland Park could be peated. Right. No, I think that's what's uh, incredible about it is it's got a lot of richness, a lot of complexity, but yet manages to be light at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to be compass... what it's one of those things where compass box just doesn't seem to do anything wrong with their blends. No, they're I mean, except for that, like, what's the or or orangery? 
Is yeah, the, well, that's that doesn't really count, right? That, that, yeah, they they get that one swing and a miss. Yeah, there's. Uh, I'm we, getting we, this. I'm getting this like sort of heavy tannic flip that it does, which I remember encountering in uh, Glen Goyne actually. Glen and Goyne. Josh is the Glen Goyne expert. Yeah, and no, that, I like Glen Goyne a lot. And well, I'm not the Glen Goyne expert. My buddy Andy in that uh, in the UK, he uh, he turned me on to Glen Goyne, and I, I really do enjoy it, but. Um, I could see uh, some similarity there for sure. Glen Goyne has a lot of that rich but light, also fruity. No peat though, no peat yeah. to Glen Goyne yeah. at all. Yeah. In uh, fact, I think they advertise on the bottles. Oh, entirely unpeated. Yeah. No, as it's if it's, uh, as if it's it, even evil practice, right? They go, they go as far as to say never peat. Yeah. Oh, God. Forbidden. But. No, I, I'm a big Glen Goyne fan, and I, I would say this, you know, definitely has some some overlap with that. Yeah. No, this is really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you if you can find it, uh, obviously a limited edition thing. Uh, part I, I I don't know about you guys. Well, actually, I do know about you, Vito. But with, <laughs> Adam, with the uh, with the boxes and the tubes and things that uh, whiskeys come in, do you keep them? Do you throw them away? Do you, uh, do you keep them temporarily? What do you do? I keep them. I currently have, I don't know, about eight or nine of them as well as this Deanston, which stays under there, uh, under my desk at the moment. Right. Uh, I don't know what I want to do with them, uh, but uh, I mean, I don't, uh, so many of them are so gorgeous that I just want to keep them around. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll display them somehow someday, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not too short for space. Uh, if it if it really does fill up in the next uh, couple of months, I'll probably uh, uh, I'll probably get rid of a few of them, or right. at least move them to the basement. Is you know I'm 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 a collector, right? I like uh, I like keeping stuff. I like nice looking stuff. Um, uh, I like having the history in front of me. Uh, sure. So I tend to I tend to keep most of them. That phenomenology bottles mine. Don't forget that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys uh, decide via a lottery or something who get when you split a bottle who well, gets well, to keep the the bottle and the packaging and stuff. We're gonna do that, except and that was we only agreed to that after Vito just called shotgun on this one. <laughs> so, what I do. so you know the rest of us called bullshit and uh, and said no 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 we're we're gonna have a draw next time. Yeah, I generally, and I'm going to hold it up here, I don't usually keep the tubes and the boxes and stuff now, but the some of the compass box ones like this one and the Flaming Heart, I, I don't even know what I'm going to do with it or what what am I keeping it for. I don't exactly. know. Exactly. Like, it's got this Dali painting slash, uh, it's got some Roman elements in there and then the gold bits there dripping off the fingers. It's it's. Stunning. Just such an incredibly uh, stunning box and, and, and the bottle as well. Um, they do an amazing, amazing job with the artwork. So I I haven't been able to bring myself to throw this thing away. And I don't know what I'm going to do with it once the bottle's done. Um, but it's, it's definitely one of the most unique uh, packaging uh, examples in Scotch whiskey, I think. You know, it, their whole line, really. Absolutely. Yeah, they do a great job with that. Do you have any other compass box, or is it just the phenomenology at the moment? I've been through a bottle of Oak Cross and a bottle of Spice Tree already. Okay. Uh, so, and we also did uh, one of those bottle splits on the new Flaming Heart, which is also excellent. Yes. Um, obviously, a very different style of of Scotch whiskey from this one, but uh, but yeah, and I I was really surprised. I was telling the guys before we started the show. Um, I, I actually like the design of the uh, new Flaming Heart a little bit better than the Phenomenology. It's right over here. I love that whiskey. Like, the Flaming Heart's incredible. Like that combination of fruit and smoke just does it for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like you can't really see it on the screen, but the label is embossed, so it's got texture to it, and it's it was sealed with this like dark burnished coppery wax. Oh, yeah, they do this incredible job of making it feel and look very premium. <laughs> Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's getting more and more sort of, I don't know, like, uh, like aromatic. That's not quite what I mean to say, but. Yeah. It, it, Potpourri a bit. It changes yeah, a bit. the glass for sure. 
Yeah, certainly that floral thing you mentioned is absolutely yeah uh, coming out to the front. Lavender. I could totally oh, yeah. see lavender. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even on the taste, actually. You yeah, that's where I got. That's where I got it. Was on the taste. Absolutely. And um, my wife Gretchen, she's she's famous for every time we go to Balcones for ordering lavender lattes across the street. It's now a thing. <laughs> it's now a thing that she gets teased about. Lavender uh, latte. Lavender lattes, and yeah, I'm sure they're delicious. They are. They're they're delicious. Like. It kind of smells like walking into a Hallmark store, though. I mean, just potpourri, <laughs> like crazy. No, I'm I'm uh, I'm a big fan of. I have a ridiculous sweet tooth, which is sort of bizarre because I don't. I often don't like super sweet whiskeys, but I'm you know, if you see me walking down the street and it looks like I'm holding a coffee, chances are it's a hot chocolate. Ah, really? yeah, I'm, I'm a I'm a hot chocolate man, and Second Cup, which is a big. Uh, uh, coffee shop chain uh, mm -hmm. in Canada mm -hmm. uh, or Ontario, at least, makes a really good uh, a hot chocolate that's pretty cheap. Uh, so those are, ooh, those are the best. Nice. Especially on, on the cold walk to and from campus. You know the the lavender. There's a there's one of these like very hip new fancy ice cream shops uh, in Austin. It's it well, it's not new. It's been around for a few years, but uh, it it has that. It's like that new restaurant naming convention thing where they pick a word and being an ice cream, if they pick one single word that sounds like sexy and cool and for an ice cream shop, they named it lick. <laughs> <laughs> it's called lick. And, uh, and don't get me wrong. Lick makes awesome ice cream, but there's this one that sounds ridiculous. Like it sounds like it would kind of be terrible, but it really, really works. It is okay. lavender, honey, and goat cheese ice cream. Oh, I can totally see it. It's incredible. Oh, I can totally see that. It's incredible. The one that I really like from my local, uh, local, it's in, in the middle of downtown, uh, is blueberry basil. Oh, nice. It's, yeah, it, I can absolutely a, see that. As a, as a sorbetto. Mm -hmm. And oh, oh, is it tasty. And uh, they make the best chocolate. They're a chocolate shop predominantly, and they make the best chocolate in the city. Uh, and so naturally their chocolate gelato is also the best in the city. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Also they're, as far as price goes they they give you a big cone. Yeah. I see Gretchen asking in the chat. What about Tim Hortons? Tim Hortons hot chocolate is garbage. It's <laughs> oh, like, we it's just like, got a Canadian on record shitting. It's on like Tim the cheapest, shittiest hot chocolate you could imagine. <laughs> like, it comes out of a machine. Whereas, you know, you go to the other place, you know, they, they, it's a mix, but, you know, it's, you can tell that there's actual cocoa powder in there. They steam some milk up fresh for you. Right. You know, that's, I kind of like Tim Horton's hot chocolate. Oh, that's oh all right. I don't, I, I'm not I a mean, snob when it comes, I'm not a snob when it comes to my hot chocolate. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, St Steven Jackson in the chat is, is also asking uh, if I heard about the wine called Foreskins. Amazing. <laughs> I, I so, did see that picture today. Foreskins wine. Yeah, uh, not, not foreskins, four skins. Four skins. That gap between the words has never been more important. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. How you pronounce it is everything. Um, I did see that today and I found it hilarious and I forwarded it to all my friends. So, um, yeah. Nicholas in the chat saying rosemary, olive oil, and sea salt ice cream. That's amazing. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's, olive cream. That's not even olive like. Is, yeah, olive oil is the, like the single tastiest substance on the face of the earth. So, I mean, sorry. Oh, apologies for the whiskey. And there's Brad somehow not on video. Yeah. Come on, I shouldn't be here. Neither <laughs> than me, God. Uh, I'm, barely, I'm barely keeping up, man. He says you all shit on Tim Hortons, but uh, it's like Starbucks, but they don't pretend uh, pretend that it's fancy. Yeah, it's 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 not the quality is not the same as Starbucks, which obviously isn't saying much. Right. Um, Starbucks Tim tastes Hortons, they, they were they were all you know about like the fresh donuts, fresh baked everything, and then ten or so years ago they went. Uh, they centralized everything and it's all from frozen now. So sure. it's still garbage. Steve and I am not part Italian. I am 100% uh, 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 Taiwanese. 
<laughs> Taiwanese. I was trying to come up with something. Uh, no, I'm mostly Polish and Belarusian, I think. But uh, yeah, anyways, no, would that be from all, all the hand motions and, and every time I, I've been going like this? <laughs> I swear I never do. It must be the phenomenology or maybe the extended conversation with Vito. Yeah, yeah I have that effect on a lot of people. The yeah, people the Italian. Italian when they talk yeah. to me. The, the phrase, there's a little Italian in all of us, becomes much more alarming when Vito's around. <laughs> <laughs> so we. So. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, that brings us to a little bit of a uh, little bit of recommendations, a little bit of fiddly bits, little, little fiddly bits, little fiddly bits. Um, I'm going to go. I'm gonna go ahead and first. I'm gonna. Um, yeah. It has nothing to do with with whiskey. How dare you? I know. I'm making it a thing. I'm gonna try to keep it uh, all, a little bit off topic, just to keep everyone's uh, see if every, anyone's paying attention. Fair enough. Um, something to recommend uh, would be finding the mechanic you can trust with everything. Um, I've gone through a lot of mechanics uh, since I've owned a car last ten years. And uh, to be able to go to a to go be able to go to your mechanic and just be like, I need you to take care of everything that's wrong with the car, and know that you're not gonna get ripped off or taken for a ride, yeah, is probably the most uh, amazing feeling of adultness uh, that I've experienced so far in my short adult life. Beto's adulting so hard right so now. So hard, the, <laughs> you know. Like when when you when you when you, it's, it's and that's utmost trust. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's hard to come by a good mechanic for sure. I, yeah. I was I was recently in Ottawa and uh, um, um, seamless auto care out in Ottawa, out in um, uh, Carlton Place. If anyone's familiar with that, if, or if anyone's in that area, seamless auto care. They are amazing. Um, the guys there are awesome. They're super knowledgeable. They break down everything for you. Uh, they, like, I, I was recommended to them, and I went there, and I said, listen, there's so much wrong with this car. He's like, come for a ride with me. I said, I'm going to drive it around. I want you there. I want you to explain. And he, like, we drove around for about 20 minutes, and he came back, and he's like, okay, no worries. I'm going to put it on the lift, take a look at a couple of things. I was watching them. He's like, okay, so come look at this over here. This is what's going on over here. This could affect this. And like, you just, uh, I felt like I was learning right. um, to be able to make as well of a formed decision as, as I possibly could when it came time to decide what I wanted to have done to the car. Yeah. Um, and um, it took a long time. It took a long, long time to find, uh, to find a place like that. And uh, my car, my car has never run better. That's great. Uh, the, you know, the re it's funny that you bring this up because just last week, uh, Gretchen, her car went into uh, the dealership that we bought it from just for regular maintenance and such. And uh, they have gone to the links now of taking a video of the mechanic looking at your car and explaining what he found and what he tested and et cetera. Right. And then they will post that video to their website and send you a link so you can watch the mechanic taking a look at your car and explaining what he's done and, and what he found and all that kind of stuff. So that's, uh, that's I was, I was time really time. super impressed by that. Uh, they, yeah. they, they just went to those links to make you feel taken care of. So. You know, I bet there that there's there are mechanics out there who would who would be doing that anyways. Who were were talking out what they're doing would be you know would be helpful. I, I know uh, certainly I'm that way with uh, well with whiskey for one thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess this sort of segues into what I was going to say was uh, for my fiddly bit on the end. We're good. There that goes the fiddly bit. That, yeah, it's gone. That was the Glencairn <laughs> lid. <laughs> which I oop, that way, which I had carefully perched atop one of the bottles here as a sort of crown. It's glorious. Anyways, um, what was I talking about? Oh crap. Uh, Fifty bits. Help me. All right, thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, you guys uh, have mentioned my tasting notes for a while. Uh, or, or you've mentioned that those repeatedly. Uh, I do. I uh, I do so epic. I, I mean, so what it is, I've been drinking whiskey for just over a year. Yeah. Um, 
when I started at first, uh, when I started at first, I didn't drink any hard liquor at all. I'd have a beer every now and then, but I, you know, I really didn't just didn't drink that much. Um, uh, I, I have a fairly wide exposure to different kinds of foods and flavors, but sure. you know, I, I never, I had never gone into something, you know, to taste it uh, for, and, you know, really uh, get into things. And it, it was all practice was what it was. I started with uh, Chivas Regal 12, which was the first whiskey that I really started tasting to sip it. Um, then afterwards, the first bottle of single malt I bought was a uh, classic Laddie, which I've had, had my own stream about before because I love that whiskey so much. Yeah, that's um, great stuff. And eventually I, I worked up the confidence to publish my first review, which was Compass Box Oak Cross, I think. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's all practice. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, knowing, uh, uh, I, I have a pretty good memory for not, you know, <laughs> things that I have to do or things that I should put <laughs> in the calendar, uh, but for, for sensations at least. Not for the practical, so, thing, but yeah, yeah, there you go. No, same, so, here, same here. So, and for memories as well. And my favorite part of, of tasting whiskey is when it immediately brings to mind, uh, a specific memory, uh, hopefully a happy memory. The craziest one of those that I've ever experienced was my first time uh, time trying Laphroaig Triple Wood. Oh. I happened to be at uh, my uh, local fantastic Scotch bar, the Caledonian, uh, which Vito and I uh, uh, frequent at this point. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, I was there with my buddy Scotty, who I think is watching. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, I wanted to try the Freud Triple Wood. I like the Freud. So, and my first whiff on the nose instantly brought to mind the uh, beanless beef chili that goes on the hot dogs at Lafayette Coney Islands in New York or New York, Detroit. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it smelled like beef chili. And that it was, it was one of the it was one of the only one of the few times in my life where I like did like a quadruple take like wait a minute, what the heck? <laughs> not just a double a quadruple take like just it like was, oh, what a, 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 from aware I think that's the defining characteristic right like like I I completely agree I've been that's the whole reason um, I started writing reviews was to try and. Uh, challenge myself to focus and think about those things and learn and remember and, and, uh, and all of that to, to progress in the whiskey journey. But, um, as you learn those things, you get further along, you start triggering those specific memories. That's really kind of the magic part, but you seem to be particularly gifted at those really unusually specific tasting notes like that right like this is the chili that i had in detroit at this one restaurant well, to be fair that's the place we go to whenever we're in detroit but it's still and so I, personal and i mean, obscure for so many people it's like i could eat right, like five of those hot dogs in one sitting they're so good and it's a very it's i don't know what they do to the chili uh but it's a it's got a particular flavor to it and it's been the exact same for the 20 years that i've been going there so, I know what they yeah. do. Yeah. Do you, I, do, do you guys know that I, I moved here to Austin from Michigan? And generally, <laughs> yeah, I used to live in Flint, Michigan. There uh, you go. And uh, generally, that Coney the water, Island... The water quality problems haven't improved so much. No, no well, unfortunately, I made it out before then. But uh, now you can't drink the water there, sadly. But yeah. uh, no, the uh, generally, the Coney sauce... At most Coney Island restaurants, the secret ingredient is lamb heart. Whoa. Now, that's not every place. I'm not saying this is necessarily the place you're talking about, but but a Coney sauce in a lot of places in Michigan, lamb heart is the secret ingredient. Lamb heart. It told me that. <laughs> it's delicious. It's like That's what gives it that like rich, dark, minerally kind of thing, right? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. We'll eat other parts of the lamb, so yeah. sure. Yep. Anyways, that was that's probably the craziest uh, specific memory I've ever got. I've ever been that's ever been evoked by a whiskey for me. Uh, yeah, felt like sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh... I really like the whiskey. The rest of the whiskey didn't taste like chili, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. That was your most memorable, uh, your, your most unique tasting note? 
music mm. that you've ever had? Yeah. I what, think what, do you, so. what, what do you think is the most common? Like what is something you find most often in whiskey? I actually went through a bunch of my reviews a couple of days ago to try and find, uh, uh, try and like compile my most common tasting notes. For me, like I don't get tasting notes of things that I don't eat. Right. So, right. um, uh, I don't know. Um, like I Did never, you? I never used to pick up mint in whiskey cause I, or most of my life, I really didn't like mint. Okay. I mean, ultimately flavored toothpastes and, you know, um, I didn't like mint at all. So at first, you know, I'd, I'd never be looking for that. Um, uh, I've, so apparently some of my most common tasting notes are vanilla, which is pretty ubiquitous because, you know, that comes from ex-bourbon barrels. Right. And most of what I taste is scotch. So most of that's Asian ex-bourbon. Uh, uh, ginger, because I really like ginger. Mm -hmm. And again, that's sort of, and I go for, you know, sort of the lighter, more fresh malts, sort of like Balblair and uh oban and uh, brucolatic and right. those tend to have a lot of that sort of sharp ginger flavor um and i mean just going by numbers beet smoke i think is is it somewhere in the top five just because i like sure. Whiskey. sure no um, i have i have seen that uh ginger tasting note for me quite a bit so yeah, yeah that's true well he is ginger yeah that's true also ginger ale is my number one drink uh, other than whiskey very right. ginger ale guys Oh, that's, that's the real shit. It's not a ginger ale. Yes, it is. Totally it's is. Not. It's a, isn't it a ginger soda? I think oh, you can still yeah. call it ginger ale, even though it's not a beer, technically. I'm going to have to go down to my fridge in a little bit uh, uh, and check because I actually I somehow <laughs> don't know. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I don't know what the difference is, but I think on the, on the can it actually says ginger soda. We demand transparency and labeling of ginger-based beverages. Well, <laughs> what what has changed on the can? It used to say barrel-aged bold taste. And the, the old story about how it was created is that, you know, Mr. Werner or whatever, who owned the this uh, drugstore, basically, yeah. uh, went off to fight in the Civil War and had to leave some of his medicine, medicinal sugar, uh, herb and spice syrup in this in this oak barrel and he got back three years later and found it was delicious right uh, so for so it was aged in oak barrels so now so it used to say barrel aged bold taste uh, around around a barrel which was all fine and it was delicious uh now in the past seven eight years they the picture of the barrel is still there but it says authentic bold taste <laughs> so the uh so apparently they've stopped using, uh, they've stopped oak aging Verners, right. which is a damn shame because it's delicious. And I remember it being better than it was. It's a travesty. Yeah. travesty. yeah, I remember it being better in the past than it is now. You so. know, a, a, a common thing, speaking of going uh, back to Michigan as well, uh, a common thing at, um, well, at, at least at a particular chain called Halo Burger, they would take mm -hmm. a vanilla shake and then blend in Verner's, oh, which for some reason they call a Boston cooler. I don't know. Yeah, understand. you were telling me about that, and I had no idea where the Boston came from. I don't. I have. Yeah, I haven't even bothered to to research where that comes from. But that is the most amazing thing: combination vanilla shake with Verner's. Oh uh, yeah, the um at one uh, Brooklynic whiskey event I went to, I walked in and the brand ambassador was. Uh, standing in front of a giant punch bowl with one hand pouring in classic Lottie and mm -hmm. the other hand pouring in Verner's. Oh, and, and I knew that I was in the right place. <laughs> yes. Um, these are my he, people. He, he basically ended up, ended up making like basically a, a dark and stormy or a Kentucky mule, but with, uh, with Brooke Lottie. Right, and right. I've since made it at home with Verner's again. and It's absolutely delicious. I'm going to have to try that. Yeah, That's get amazing. get some lime, some burners, some angostura. Mm, it's a good shit. So, like uh, you know, with your uh, with your vast knowledge and ex and and expertise and tasting notes, uh, maybe you do something a little similar to to what I do. Uh, mm. I I don't know if you have any suggestions for a variation on this, but a game I like to play, I like to call "Guess That Whiskey," mm. and and that's where I'll have Gretchen. You know, we'll either grab a bottle from the cabinet, pour something, 
let me guess what it is. That's a, that's a tough one, right? I can usually identify, oh, that's a bourbon. Oh, that's a scotch. That's an Irish. But, yeah. um, you know, pinpointing the bottle can be difficult. Uh, mm-hmm. What I find to be the most fun and the most educational um, is to come in here and pick out a series of three bottles, a series of five bottles. And I know what's in in the choices, but I have her pour five glasses, let's say. Mm-hmm. And I just did this the other day. I did two rounds, one with Irish and then one with peated whiskey, with peated scotch. And uh, I try and match what's in the glass to you know which bottle did it come from. And mm-hmm. also is my presumed favorite, what I think going in is going to be my favorite whiskey. Mm -hmm. Does that stand up when I don't know which is which? Interesting. Uh, So that's, that's, I find that to be, you know, it's that twofold game of like, can I identify which whiskey goes with which bottle? And does what I assume to be the favorite when I don't know which one it is, does it still stand out? And uh, I found with the Irish round, Mm-hmm. I, I mixed up uh, Jameson Black Barrel with, uh, with Writer's Tears. Okay. And the only reason was I picked up this kind of slight bitter note on it, and I attributed that to the extra barrel aging or the double barreling or whatever they do with Jameson Black Barrel, and it turned out that, no, that was the Writer's Tears I picked up some bitterness in. Ah, I actually you. liked the Jameson Black Barrel better. Um and then I presume my favorite was going to be red breast 12 cast strength. And that one just, you know, immediately I pick it up and like, yep, that's the red breast. <laughs> yeah. That, one, that one's pretty easy to spot. Um, see the, I love doing blind tastings. I can't do it with my whiskey because they're all too different. Right. And I'm too familiar with all of them. Cause you have, you know, like 500 balconuses and uh, <laughs> tons of art bags and compass boxes and many that are, that are, similar right whereas you know uh on my students budget i um i have to you know pick out my favorite from every sort of flavor profile so all right so sure. fresh and clean i'll go for this pal blair sherry bomb i got the red breast i got the spring bank uh you know heavy peat and got Octomore, beautiful um what i have been doing i've been getting uh so i've been getting these uh i did a whiskey sample swap a blind whiskey sample swap yeah that's super cool of mine. And he sent me, uh, well, way rarer and cooler stuff than I got. Yeah. Uh, uh, than I gave him. Uh, but such is the nature of these things. He also sent me like six samples, and I sent him like three, uh, which, you know, three were required. I gave him something extra, I think. I think it was Brad's Infinity Bottle that I gave him as, a, as an extra <laughs> sample. Like, good luck guessing that, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, some of them have been, they've been hard to guess. Uh, generally the process is you go on the, uh, the, the discord channel, uh, for, uh, uh, r slash scotch, the scotch subreddit mm-hmm. and you, uh, or the whiskey network subreddits, uh, and you sort of do it live and you guess, you know, what barrels it's aged in, how old it is, what you think the ABV is and what you think the distillery is. Or if, you know, if you think if you're feeling lucky, you guess exactly what it is. Uh, sure. and I've been doing okay with barrel type. That's been, I think, the easiest. ABV, I've been fooled a couple of times. Mm-hmm. There's been one that I think it was a Highland Park that I thought was maybe 46%. It turned out to be 56 but I had no idea. It was the smoothest drinking cask strength whiskey I've ever come across. And, you know, who would have thought, uh, who would have thought that if I had seen the label, right? Sure. If it would have been Isle of Aaron, I probably would have just in my head, even if I'm trying not to, I'd give it some extra points just because <laughs> I like the brand. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I love blind tastings. I you really know, do. What was funny is the, uh, the, the round with the Irish, I was pretty successful. I made the one I transposed, uh, two bottles, but otherwise I got it. I nailed them all pretty quickly as to which one was which. And, nice. and then with the peated ones, a hundred percent wrong. I got them all <laughs> incorrect. I, I guessed one of them correct at first. I said, oh, that one's the Ardbeg. And then I came back and I second guessed myself. I was correct the first time. And then I, you know, I, I second guessed my first instincts and, and changed my answer. And it turns out I was a hundred percent wrong. Uh, but wow. I learned a lot from that experience too, right? Like, 
going back afterwards and saying, I'm going to highly recommend this, you know, play this game with whatever whiskeys that you have, you know, and you can, you can do a, a, some variations on it with whatever collection that you have available, but uh, to go back and, and say, okay, I tried this. I made a guess. What did I get wrong? Okay. Now, why did I get that wrong? And, and what could I pick out next time as being an identifying characteristic of this whiskey? Like I had a peat, a heavily peated Highland uh, Edredor Balakin. And mm. after I knew what it was, I pick it up and I go, oh, right. It's more floral and it doesn't have quite the same character as an Isla Pete. Okay, I can store that away for next time and hopefully now I can better identify these things in the future. Um, so that, I, I, I like playing that game. Not only is it fun and you get to try different whiskeys, but you get to learn more about it, uh, by comparison and, and, and test yourself to see if your preconceived notions about what, which one's your favorite and what did they taste like? It, does that hold up when you don't know what you're drinking? Yeah. True wisdom. Yeah. That's what comes out of that. Yeah. There cool. you go. Well, that uh, I, I learned a lot listening to you guys. Yeah, I'm, uh, I it was it was nice. It was actually it. really nice and interesting to to probably be Brad for the episode and just kind of <laughs> ha- and, and hang back while while two extroverts just talked with each other. <laughs> yeah. It's a very interesting perspective. I recommend it. Yeah, but yeah, that that was uh, that was good. That was awesome. Um, well, big thank you to Adam for yeah. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. For um, Coming in and filling in, wonderfully filling in. We're uh, we're definitely gonna ask you to come back at a, at a point in the future. Absolutely, um, wonderful to to talk and uh, share your your uh, expertise on and the epic, epic, epic tasting notes. Epic, better than Whittington tasting notes. Better than Whittington. Better than all right. Debatable. <laughs> I'll have to go down and take a psalm course, and then we'll, we'll go head to head and uh, try to out tasting note each other. There, there we go. go. That'll be a blast, actually. I really want to try that now that I've just said it. Damn. Anyways, <laughs> we'll, fi- we'll figure we'll figure it out. There you go. Yeah. In Gosh, the meantime, in, in the meantime, uh, let's let's get out of here. Um, let everyone uh, wind down and um, get ready for next week. Yeah. So cheers. Thanks, uh, thanks for uh, checking it out, everybody. Everybody in the chat. Um, yeah, you guys are awesome. Uh, the chat was uh, was pretty good. Got uh, a lot of. Uh, a lot of feedback and uh, banter between everybody. So yeah, it was a, a lot of fun. And uh, like, and, comment, subscribe. Like, All comment, subscribe. Hit, hit, hit that bell again. Don't want to smash that motherfucking like button. <laughs> 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 and until until next week, um, stay classy. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers, cheers, cheers friends. Mm.